so when you look at this segment, uh, I could have gone two ways. Uh, the word righteous is mentioned four times. You find it in verse 137 twice, righteous and right. Mm. Then verse 138, you find the word righteous. I hope in your Bible you are able to underline this because uh, uh, that, that's the best way to learn. 142, your righteousness. <clears throat> And then verse 144, your statutes are always righteous. So that's repeated four times and we could have gone with the title righteousness. But actually I was uh, very powerfully impacted by verse 138 where it says, the statutes you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. They are fully trustworthy. So we are going to go with that title. God's word is fully trustworthy. And that's a truth where we need to hear over and over again, right? Because you have friends at school who try to undermine the Bible, the credibility of the Bible. And uh, when you go to university, you'll get hit big time, right? There'll be professors who will openly ridicule the Bible. And so you have to be fully convinced 200% that the Bible, the word of God is fully trustworthy. So uh, I have given you these three I words before, but uh, if you can just again rehearse it in your thinking, the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God, right? I grew up with those words. <laughs> Every peach, a preacher who came to town when I was growing up as a teenager, the first uh, sentence they would utter is that the Bible is infallible, inspired, inerrant. That's how they start. And then they go into their message. So I think we need to come back to that again today uh, because of uh, the way the Bible is being despised. They are fully trustworthy. And we are going to look at this under four headings. So a, in your notes, God's word is trustworthy no matter what people do. And you can also add and say, no matter what people say and do, it doesn't matter. The word of God is, uh, is uh, true, absolutely true. Now, again, you've got to understand the context. The psalmist had now worn himself out. Uh, I mean, he's really tired. He's really tired because these persecutors, these enemies who had been taunting him, actually they were taunting God and they were taunting God's word. And the psalmist was trying to, you know, give them reasons, arguments as to why the word of God is trustworthy, but they won't listen. So he's very discouraged. The, the psalmist is very discouraged. He's very tired. He had tried to convince uh, the people, the enemies, uh, to trust God's word, but they both ignored him and the scriptures. Uh, he says that in verse 139, for my enemies ignore your words. They ignore your words. You know, you have a saying in English, it's like pouring water on a duck's back. I, I feel that way sometimes when I preach. And I say to myself, what's really happening, you know? Uh, I'm preaching, I'm teaching the word. Is, is it really getting, it, getting into the hearts of the people? Are people really listening, right? And especially on Zoom, once you switch the video off, no one has an idea of what people are doing, right? Whether they are even there, <laughs> we don't know. And uh, so <clears throat> uh, I can in a small way identify with the psalmist. Are people really listening and are they responding or are they ignoring your words? So I want you to write two M words down in your notes. It's not here on the screen. What do people ignore or reject? The two M words are the message and the messenger. They ignore the message and the messenger. That's the whole Old Testament and the New Testament. Whenever a messenger came, what did the people do? Old Testament. 
they would stone the messenger, the prophet, kill him. So they thought that by silencing the messenger, you can silence the message. <laughs> but they got it wrong. Every time one messenger is killed, God raises up another messenger, right? And the message can never, 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 ever be killed, right? So don't get discouraged. You and I are the messengers and we have a message. And as we go out with the message, the greatest message ever to the people, to your friends, don't be surprised, don't be shocked uh, if it gets a cold uh, response, okay? Psalm has felt it and he's expressing it for us. <laughs> but he had been faithful even as the word of God is faithful. And that's the secret, to be faithful, to continue preaching, to continue teaching, to be faithful. And the word of God is faithful. The word of God will never, ever fail. It is dynamite. It is the power of God. I remind myself of that. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. The, the, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to people, but it is the power of God, right? And then the psalmist says that God is righteous and his word is righteous. So why is uh, God's word trustworthy? Because of the character of God and the nature of the message. So now let's uh, look at that. God is righteous. He begins with that statement in verse 137. Now I'm going to give you a paragraph uh, I again believe this was Spurgeon, but this is an amazing paragraph on the righteousness of God. And you'll have to read it a few times over to really get it. You won't get it in one reading, right? So I'm going to read it real slow. Try and absorb it. Try and absorb some of these words. Essentially, <clears throat> originally, and of himself, naturally, immutably, universally, in all his ways and works of nature and grace, in his thoughts, purposes, counsels, and decrees, in all the dispensations of his providence, I like that phrase, in all the dispensations of his providence, in redemption, in the justification of a sinner, in the pardon of sin, and in the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, God is righteous. That's a mouthful. I, I wish I could tell you, uh, memorize it. <laughs> memorize it. <laughs> Big words. But what a paragraph that highlights the righteousness of God. God, God is righteous. <clears throat> By the way, the last one, the gift of eternal life through Christ. Tomorrow's sermon is going to be about eternal life. What is eternal life? How do we receive eternal life? How do we know we have eternal life? And we are going to look at 10 certainties. And uh, all this is going to be another evangelistic message. So I want to encourage you to reach out to a friend who is a seeker, who is struggling, who may have doubts. Uh, get them to listen. And uh, it will be a very, very impactful sermon on eternal life. So God in his person, he is righteous. He is always right. God is always right. Was it yesterday we received the news about that young pastor being killed by a drunk driver, 47 years old, with five children? And my first gut reaction was, God, why? God, why? He's serving in a very difficult part of Sri Lanka. And uh, God, at a time when we need servants like this, God, why did you take him home? And then I have to say to myself, God is sovereign and God is always right. He has permitted it. He has permitted it. Why? We don't know. Right? So when uh, you hear news like that, <laughs> you would tend to question the righteousness of God. Is God right here? Did he do the right thing here? And uh, we have to bow 
before his righteousness. And we have to say God is always right. Just like how we say God is good all the time, we have to learn to say God is right all the time. And then the psalmist says God's word is righteous. Not only is God righteous, his word is righteous. Again, that's verse 137 in one line. He is affirming the righteousness of God as a person and the righteousness of the scriptures. The righteous character of God is displayed in his word. In this, uh, the word of God is an accurate revelation of God, not only of his thoughts, but also of his very character. The Bible mirrors the character of God. Anyone who cares about knowing <clears throat> what is righteous and wants to act righteously should study the Bible. That's the only place where we find the answers to righteousness, right? Your laws are right. Three times in this passage, uh, the psalmist says that God's word is right. In fact, verse 142 in my translation, he says, your law is true. Your law is true. So again, another great paragraph. Again, you have to chew on this. You can't uh, absorb it all in one reading. <clears throat> they are according to the rules of justice and equity. He is referring to the precepts of the word. And you may want to say number one on top of that, the doctrines of the gospel, number two, the judgments of God inflicted on wicked men, that's number three, all the providential dealings of God with his people, number four, and the final judgment, number five. So in those five areas, God's word is absolutely right. Uh, verse 138, the statues you laid down are righteous. He's again uh, uh, repeating it for emphasis, Repe repetition for emphasis. His word is fully trustworthy, though intellectual giants may attack it and even ridicule it. The word stands and will be here long after they are dead and their books have been forgotten. People may sin and die but God's righteousness and the righteous word will always remain. They are eternal. They are eternal. Now verse 139. The more the enemies of the psalmist rejected the word of God, the more he was determined to be zealous for those words. He would make sure that he honored the word of God even if others did not. That's a very interesting dynamic. The more the persecution, the more the rejection of the word of God, the more it fired up the psalmist. And the more zeal he had uh, to keep proclaiming the gospel, the word of God. You know, uh, when I uh, came to Christ in 1973, uh, I moved pretty closely with my classmates, one of whom happened to be a Hindu. I mean, this guy was not a practicing Hindu, but, uh, but he went as a nominal Hindu. His mom would make some lovely palaharam and coffee. I mean, they were known for their coffee. And coffee at that time was a luxury. <laughs> you, you don't get coffee every day, right? So we used to play cricket and we used to make a beeline to his house. Because we know the mother would have made some palaharam and the coffee would be there. So when we went, uh, I always used to uh, chat with his dad. And very quietly, I, I shared the gospel with him, right? And one day he looked at me and he said, son, uh, you should not be telling this to others. I still distinctly remember that uh, conversation. And I said, uncle, this uh, message has totally changed my life. And how could I not share it with people when my life has changed because of this message? And uh, it's like saying, a, cancer, a cure for cancer has been found, but we'll keep it quiet. We are not going to tell it to anyone. So uh, that conversation really gave me the motivation to share the gospel more. <laughs> it could have gone the other way too. I could have got scared. I mean, this is a much older person, a highly respectable person telling me to shut up, <laughs> telling me to shut up with regard to the gospel, but it fired me up. 
So I want to tell you that when you run into rejection, it should not uh, cause you to fold up and go quiet. It should cause you to become more zealous. That's the word uh, the psalmist use, uses in 139. My zeal wears me out. He's full of energy. He's uh, sharing the gospel. The message is being rejected, but he continues to share. And it's a blessed tiredness. Let me put it that way. A blessed tiredness. A tiredness that comes because you have faithfully shared the word and you're leaving the results in God's hands. So uh, every night uh, before I go to bed, uh, I experience this blessed tiredness. You know, you, you talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, you share the word in a group situation like what we are doing now. Uh, and, uh, and you come home and, and you're tired physically, emotionally. Uh, uh, you're tired, but it's a blessed tiredness, right? I hope uh, all of you would experience that more and more in your life. My zeal wears me out. I'm really tired, but it's a blessed tiredness because what I'm doing has eternal significance, right? Zeal implies energy and action. <clears throat> the appreciation of the psalmist for the word of God was not passive. I mean, you can mouth words, right? I also can mouth words. Oh, the word of God is this, the word of God is that. But what are we doing about it? That's the question. The living and active word of God brought forth a living and active response from the psalmist. And it's very interesting in John chapter 2, uh, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, it is said that zeal for God's house consumed him. It's actually a prophecy made in Psalm 69. And it came true in the life of the Lord Jesus, and you find those words uh, recorded in John 2 after he cleansed the temple. Remember, he cleansed the temple twice, at the beginning of his ministry and also at the end of his ministry. So in three years, the people hadn't learned anything. <laughs> uh, you would have thought they would have learned after the first uh, experience, you know, when the Lord made a whip and uh, uh, gave them a flogging and chased them all out. <laughs> And they would have said, hey, man, he's serious. Who does he think he is? Uh, I mean, he's right. Uh, we are doing wrong. No, no, no. They never learned. They went back to their old habits again. And the Lord had to cleanse the temple a second time uh, just before he went to the cross. That's the kind of zeal the Lord had. So if uh, one word could be used to describe you and me, would it be the word zealous? Would it be the word zealous? that we are full of zeal for the Lord and for his word. You know what sad words these are? They ignore your words. They ignore your words. And that's the 21st century, isn't it? Look around. How many people in the midst of this pandemic are really turning to God? How many people are really getting into the Bible? I mean, you would think, on the Sunday morning, all our services would have more people now, right? Bible studies like this would attract more people. But uh, it's still the same crowd, right? It's the, still the same faithful crowd. We are not really seeing a huge, uh, huge uh, revival. They ignore your words. I've asked a lot of people during these uh, 12 months, uh, so tell me something about your time alone with the word. And I've been pretty saddened that it has not uh, made any big uh, change in their life. Hey, I'm now shut at home. I can't go anywhere. I have more time now to spend on the Bible, to read, to meditate, to study, to pray. And, uh, and yet they're not doing it. So I hope you don't fall into that category. I hope I don't fall into that category, that we are zealous for God and for his word. They despise and disobey them. Okay, again, two words to describe uh, the people of the psalmist day, and that's what it is today. <laughs> they despise and disobey them. But for me, for you, it should be the next two words. We love and practice them. We love and practice the word. So that's the first major point, A. God's word is trustworthy 
no matter what people do, no matter what people say. So uh, point B is the say part. God's word is trustworthy no matter what people say. So we are looking at verse 140 and 141. Your promises have been thoroughly tested and your servant loves them. Though I am lowly and despised, I do not forget your precepts. So let's explore uh, uh, verse uh, 140. Over many centuries, the scriptures have been thoroughly tested in the fires of persecution and criticism, the way a goldsmith tests precious metals, and the word of God has been found to be true. So if you look at the past 2,000 years of church history, there have always been those who have risen up and they have attacked the Bible, right? And uh, yet the Bible has stood the test. No matter what the test is, it has passed the test. And the psalmist is saying the word of God has been tested and proved to be true. Uh, the word uh, uh, in the original language is the word pure. Tested and found to be true. Uh, tried, refined, purified like gold in the furnace, absolutely perfect without the dross of vanity and fallibility which run through human writings. The more we try the promises, the surer we will find them to be true. It is pure in its sense, pure in its language, pure in its spirit, pure in its influence, and all this to the very highest degree. It's very, very pure. One of the joys of the Christian life is to find new promises in the word, test them in daily life, and find them trustworthy. The enemy wants to ignore the word, but we, his servants, we love the word. So here, here is a practical suggestion for you and me. Reaffirm your love for the word. The psalmist reaffirmed it. I love your statutes. And we need to say it uh, so that we can hear it. God, I love you. And God, I love your word. Okay, reaffirm your love for God's word. Now, uh, many years ago, uh, if you go back to our grandparents, there were Christians who used to put the promises of God to the test. And when they received what was promised, they would write T and P by the side of that promise. So what does that mean? Tried and proven. And that's what the psalmist is trying to say here. He has put the promises of God to the test and he has found it to be true. Proven to be true. Tested and proven to be true. So look at the Bible in its totality, right? And if you fulfill the conditions, there are conditions. If you fulfill the conditions, God will always come through for us. So one of the promises that I have been clinging to uh, these past 12 months has been Psalm 145. The Lord is close to the broken hearted. And uh, just, uh, just take that phrase, the Lord, the God of the Bible, Jehovah, is close, very close, very near, by my side. He has wrapped his arms around me. The Lord is very close to whom? The broken hearted. If you want a modern word for that, the hurting. The Lord is close to those who are hurting. You know, you will only experience the presence of God in a very powerful way when you go through the fire of affliction. And there is no fire of affliction greater than losing a loved one. And that too, suddenly unexpectedly. And the presence of God, you know, comes alive in an amazing way. And I can look at Psalm 145 and I can write TNP. Tested and proven. The Lord is close, very close, infinitely close to the hurting. So you should be able to give a testimony and say, you know, this past month, this one verse, I have proven it to be true in my life. I have clung to it. I have discovered God to come through for me, <laughs> right? Another one for me has been Psalm 50 and verse 15. 
call upon the Lord in the day of trouble. He will deliver us and we will glorify him. Again, three, just three simple steps. Call upon the Lord when in the day of trouble. He will deliver us and we will glorify him. And so again, I put a T and P by the side of that. Psalm 50 and verse 15. So if I look at your Bible one day, <laughs> I should see a lot of T and P's all over your Bible. Tested and proven. Can I give you another one? Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. My goodness, how many times I have proven that to be true. T and P. Matthew 6.33. Right? Now, verse 141. Though I am lowly and despised, I will not forget your precepts. The world may look upon God's people as small and despised, but when you stand on God's promises, you are a giant. So this is what today we would call self-esteem. Your self-esteem is very low. It has taken a big hit. Because of what people are saying about your God. And because of what people are saying about you and me. And we feel lowly. And we feel despised. <laughs> uh, to use an idiom. Uh, you feel like crawling under the table. And hiding. Lowly and despised. Now that is going to be our lot in this world. Uh, don't ever think you are going to get a, a big honor when you obey God and stand for God's word. It's not going to come from the world, right? The only people who would appreciate it is those in the church who are trying to mentor you and help you. But if you and I stand on God's word, in God's sight, you're a spiritual giant. You're a spiritual giant. You stood for God. You didn't fail him. Like Noah, 120 years. Noah felt lowly and uh, despised. Man, think about it. 120 years of preaching, no converts. The only converts happened to be his own family. <laughs> only his family believed him. Everyone else thought poor old Noah, he has lost it. He has lost his marbles. But what a spiritual giant Noah became. Today we name our children Noah. Why? Because he stood for God for God's righteousness and God's truth. The psalmist felt himself insignificant, both in his own estimate, small, and in the estimation of others, despised. He, when he evaluated himself, he felt he was very small. And then the world looked at him and he felt very despised. Yet he found comfort and strength in remembering the word of God. And he makes again another affirmation. I am not going to forget your word. Even though it is bringing scorn, ridicule, rejection, even, no, even though no one is listening to me, I am not going to forget God's word. I am going to remember it. Okay? We think of individuals who have been small and despised. Okay? The psalmist felt that way. Uh, David felt that way, 1 Samuel 16, as he took on Goliath. He felt small and despised. I mean, even his uh, king, own king, King Saul, <laughs> said, you are going to fight Goliath? Come on, call the bluff off. He felt very small and very despised in the eyes of his own king. And my goodness, Goliath had a time uh, when he saw uh, David walk up to him. What are they sending this little boy to me? They are insulting me. But we know the end of the story, how God honored <laughs> David, even though he felt small and despised. An older man like Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, he felt small and despised after many, many years of service. And uh, yet they found courage in God and they understood God by his word. Understand God by his word, not by your feelings, not by your circumstances. Interpret God by his word. 
you know we are living in very difficult times a lot of questions are being asked always interpret god by his word not by your feelings and not by your circumstances not by social media he must be interpreted by his word so god's word is trustworthy regardless of what people say now we come to the third segment god's word is trustworthy regardless of how you feel feelings are very important all of us have feelings right i very often hear couples oh you hurt my feelings that's very real in marriage very real in any relationship you hurt my feelings so let me read verse 142 and 143 your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true trouble and distress have come upon me but your commands give me delight did you notice those two words verse 143 trouble and distress those are his feelings trouble and distress okay so let's uh, uh, let's take it uh, statement by statement god's righteousness is everlasting isn't that beautiful that's another way of saying uh, god's righteousness is eternal it will never come to an end this is the joy and glory of the saints that what god is he always will be and his mode of procedure towards the sons of men is immutable immutable means unchanging another nice big word for that having kept his promises and dealt out justice among his people he will do so world without end god's character will not change and god's way of operating with men will not change he is a god of judgment he will punish sin in his own way in his own time he is incredibly patient he is incredibly merciful i sometimes think oh god why don't you act overnight <laughs> and then i have to remind myself that god is incredibly patient incredibly uh, merciful and so he gives time for people to repent but then finally the judgment will come and when it comes it will fall very very swiftly and uh, and there's no no uh, second chance after that your law is true the lord jesus said uh, god's word uh, for this cause oh, sorry god's word is not only true but it is also truth it is true but it is also truth the word of god is truth the son of god is truth the spirit of god is truth i have uh, said this before in sermons everything about our faith is truth god the father is truth god the son is truth god the holy spirit is truth the word of god is truth the church is the pillar of truth i mean it's all on truth our whole faith is based on truth not on falsehood right the spirit of truth wrote the word of truth and that word reveals the son of god who is truth personified when your feelings deceive you into concluding that it is not worth to serve the lord immediately turn to the scriptures and delight in your lord the psalmist felt crushing trouble pain his emotions took a big hit but even then he chose to find delight in the word of god so i want to recommend that practice to you whenever you feel down and out and the devil is tempting you and saying you know what's the point following the lord you know don't waste your time coming for these bible studies you know just do your own thing and uh, uh you need to go to the word just start reading it and find delight in the lord right now i am counseling a young person uh, young in the sense is now kind of middle age and uh, i asked you all to pray for him on wednesday and he sent me a lovely uh, little testimony this morning and he said uh, pastor i have been going through all the sermons that you have sent me 
And uh, as I've been going through these sermons, I already feel a change coming over me. And I delighted in that, uh, in that testimony, just reading the word, just listening to the sermon. And he says, already I feel a change coming over me. I praise God for that, right? But that should be true of your own experience and of my experience that uh, the word of God brings delight. The Lord Jesus said, for this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. So why did the Lord Jesus come? I mean, Christmas time, we, you hear a lot of sermons on this. He came to be our savior, but here is another reason, very powerful reason. He came to bear witness to the truth. Okay? He came to bear witness to the truth. And Pilate <laughs> asked the question of the ages, but sadly, he asked the question, but never waited for a reply. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe you have done it. You asked a question, but you never waited for the reply. Or somebody came and asked you a question, but they didn't want the reply. That's Pilate. He asked a very significant question. What is truth? He asked the question, but he didn't wait to get the response. What is truth? <laughs> and there was truth personified standing right in front of him. And he failed to realize it. Truth personified. Truth in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. For Pilate, the soldiers and armies were truth. Rome was truth. Caesar was truth. Political power was truth, but not the Lord Jesus Christ. This is especially meaningful in a day when relativism has a strong hold in the everyday thinking of people. It is common for people today to think there is no such thing as real truth or uh, you might call it absolute truth. Your friends would have told you that. Truth is relative. What is true for you is true for you. What is true for me is true for me. There's nothing called absolute truth. And they are dead wrong because the Bible is absolute truth. Everything else has got to be measured by the word of God. Western society used to believe that truth was that which corresponds to reality, what is really there. Now truth is often held to be what makes sense or is helpful to me individually. So very interesting shift that has taken place in our society. No longer the Bible is seen as absolute truth. Everything today is relative, relativism. And you will hear this more and more, especially when you go to the university stage. Now, verse 143. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands give me delight. You may experience trouble and distress as did the psalmist and still find delight in God's truth. Our feelings change, but God's word never changes. Despite the difficulties of his life, the psalmist still found delight in God's word. His appreciation of God and his word was not only valid in good times, but more so in times of trouble and anguish. Uh, Andrew, I'm wondering uh, whether you could bring, bring up uh, Jeremiah 15, 16. I think this verse uh, beautifully would tie up with uh, what we are trying to say. Jeremiah was going through, my goodness, discouragement upon discouragement. 40 years of ministry. Nothing is happening. He's thrown into prison. No one is believing him. When your words came, I ate them. <laughs> That's a nice uh, word for meditation. I uh, internalized it. When the word of God comes, we must learn to eat it, meditate, internalize it, digest it. And what's the result? Now watch the result. They were my joy and my heart's delight. Did you see that? He was depressed, low self-esteem, discouraged. What did he do? He chose to read the Bible. 
And when he re read the Bible and when he internalized it, a change came inside of him. They were my joy and my heart's delight. That's what the psalmist is saying here. I am in trouble. I am in distress. I'm not going to forget your word. I'm going to read it. I'm going to eat it. And your word was my delight. Your word was my delight. So now we come to uh, point number uh, four, the main point four. God's word is trustworthy no matter how long you live. And that's verse 144. Your statutes are always righteous. That word always, that needs to be circled in your Bible. Again, we have said it before, but it's being... Uh, reiterated. <laughs> God's word will never change. It is always, 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 always right. Righteous means right. It is relevant. So when you think of this word righteous, remember the two R words. It is right. It is relevant. Right? And if you want a third R word, it's the word rejoicing. It will produce rejoicing, as we have seen. Right, relevant, rejoicing. That's the word of God for all time, for all time. Okay, don't let anyone talk you out of that. And don't let anyone uh, say, oh, the Bible is outdated. They are the 21st century. <laughs> I mean, they are the nuclear age. How can an old book like the Bible be relevant for today? Little do they know it. Little do they know it. You know, I think I told you this, but it bears repetition. Uh, my, my, my group, I have a group of classmates, all, my goodness, interesting bunch of guys. You have Buddhists, you have Hindus, you have Muslims, you have people with no faith. And uh, you, we, we get some interesting exchange of emails. And this one guy, a Buddhist, he sent a very interesting email on motherhood right? Uh, really glorifying motherhood. And I couldn't applaud more in what he had written with little, little pictures. And suddenly the Holy Spirit told me, when you reply to everyone, quote Proverbs 31. So I took Proverbs 31, right? You know the section, the, the, the noble wife. And I just took that section from verse 10 to verse 31. I put it in bold, big letters. I pasted it <laughs> and I sent it to the whole group. And the first guy to respond was this Buddhist guy who sent it with a big thumbs up sign and he applauded. And I, that was a wonderful opening for me to introduce the Bible to this group of guys who are a totally mixed bunch. And my whole purpose was to say, hey guys, the Bible is so relevant. In the 21st century, look what the Bible has got to say about motherhood, about womanhood, high dignity. Look at it. <laughs> and then if you, uh, if you get excited about that passage, then you will want to read about other passages. Okay, so I got another email from a family that I've known over the long haul. It's a Buddhist kind of a background, but some have got converted, some have not. And one of them sent me an email and said, oh, pastor, please, 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 can you do a Bible study for our, our family circle? I said, look, I, I am heavily, heavily involved. I just don't have time to do another study. But why don't you just take the eternal manna that we put out every day and send it to them? It's only five minutes. Let them read it. And we are going through the book of Psalms. And uh, so now she started to do that. And now I'm waiting to see the response. And oh, by the way, we've got some very good responses to uh, uh, Eternal Manna. Uh, you know, uh, a lady called me. Uh, she called me a few days ago and she said, Pastor, I want you to know, I wait in the morning to listen to Eternal Manna. It's sent to me by another friend. And when that friend delays to send to me, I send her an email and said, why haven't you sent the Eternal Manna yet? So then she quickly sends it. And then after I listen to it, I send it to people back in Sri Lanka. Her circle of influence. 
I mean, I was just rejoicing. I said, God, we started something in such a simple way and now look where it is going. Where are you taking it? Right? So by the way, just uh, <laughs> a promotional, I hope you all are passing eternal manna on to others. It's only five minutes and we put in a lot of stuff in that five minutes. Don't keep it to yourself. Send it to your circle of influence and say, just listen to this. It's only five minutes. And uh, make it a, a witnessing point. Hey, uh, let's talk about what, uh, what we heard today. Right? So I'm just giving you a little, little uh, tool. Just a little tool. And uh, if you want something more, I can send you the Washed in the Word. 15-minute in-depth Bible study. And that's more for Christians who want to grow. And uh, it's now we are in the book of Philippians. So I took two words, grace and peace, and I explained it in 15 minutes. And uh, so if you want that, let me know, shoot me an email, and I will send it to you. And then you can pass it on to others, right? So <laughs> the word of God is relevant. The word of God is always right, and it will produce rejoicing in our hearts, okay? To build your life on God's word means to participate in eternity. Why? Because heaven and earth will pass away, but the Lord Jesus said, my words will never, ever pass away. So building our life on the word of God is building for eternity. So uh, a consideration of divine righteousness, uh, what, what does that really do? Convinces us of sin reconciles us to trying providence, excites a desire to imitate, and arouses to reverent adoration. Uh, that's, uh, again, I think I took it from uh, Spurgeon. He, he broke it down into those four aspects as to what divine righteousness will do for us. It will convict us of sin. God is holding up the standard before us, and then we see, my goodness, I'm failing here, I'm failing here, I'm failing here, I'm failing here. Right? It convinces of sin. It reconciles us to trying providence. My goodness, the, the circumstances of your life. How do you explain it? How do you interpret it? And the righteousness of God will reconcile. Just like this pastor who passed away. We, we have questions. But the righteousness of God reconciles a home call like that. So unexpected. And uh, excites a desire to imitate this God. I want to be right. I want a righteous life. And it arouses to reverent adoration of a righteous God. It's not the length of life. You, you have heard this before because the psalmist here says, give me understanding that I may live. Lord, till I close my eyes in death, I want to be a student of the word. I want to understand your word. I want to grow in the word. I want to uh, be a lover of your word. And I want to be a proclaimer of your word till I die. <laughs> what a resolution. What a resolution. It's not the length of life, but the depth of life that counts. And depth comes from laying hold of God's word and obeying it. How deep is your life and my life? That's the question. It's not how long, but it's how deep. The Lord Jesus spent only 33 years on this earth. And of that 33 years, 30 years were in silence. It's almost like, oh, it's like a pandemic time. <laughs> 30 years. He was in uh, obscurity, seclusion, working at a carpenter's desk. 30 years. 30 years of preparation for three years of active public ministry. We have got it all wrong. We say, okay, three years of preparation for 30 years of ministry. In God's economy, it's the reverse. 30 years of preparation for three years of active public ministry. Now, can I tell you something to shock you? John the Baptist, 30 years of preparation for just what? Less than six months of ministry. 
30 years of preparation just to introduce the Lord Jesus Christ to the, to the world and how beautifully he did it. And he uh, died as a martyr. Yet the Lord Jesus in those three years accomplished a work that is eternal. We might think that what the psalmist needed to live was deliverance from his trouble and anguish. He found understanding the word of God more important. In the trouble that I am going through, what new insights is God trying to teach me? That's the point. In the trouble that I am going through, right? What new insights is God trying to teach me? And I can tell you as a personal testimony, in these last 12 months, God has shown me a lot of insight. In the midst of my pain and tears, I have come into a lot of fresh new insights from the word of God. <laughs> so if you're telling me today, oh, my life is dry, dull, drab, you know, I do Bible reading, but it's kind of boring. It's not exciting. Maybe what you need is a dose of trouble. So just like our uncle Ravi got his COVID needle, maybe you need a needle of trouble. And then in that midst of that trouble, you're going to discover God in a way you haven't discovered him before. Right? So I'm going to pray and then open it up for discussion. Right? So let's pray.